Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're at in the world. Uh, welcome to our Power Up Your Electrical Library development. I am Charles Mayu, and with me is Saran Haldar. We are here to help you get your library up and going faster and quicker. So just a little bit about myself, um, as my camera goes in and out of focus there. Sorry about that. There we go. Um, I am the technical product manager here at Hawkridge Systems. Uh, I'm currently responsible for a lot of the day-to-day -day operations for the pre-sales engineering implementation and consulting uh, and post-sale support, making sure our support team gets you the correct answers that you need. A um, little bit more background about me. I've got over 20 years of experience with the CAD industry, starting out in AutoCAD release 12, actually release 10. First year I used it was release 10. Uh, and then a little bit of solid edge use and then SolidWorks for 20 years now. Uh, started using SolidWorks in the year 2000. Kind of hard to, to believe that I've been in the industry for that long now. Uh, some of my past experience have uh, been mining equipment, medical devices, and refrigeration display systems for supermarkets, grocery stores, that type of stuff. Um, and my colleague, I'll let him introduce himself. Right. So I'm the... I'm going to be the co-presenter here, and I'm Saran Haldar, and I'm an applications engineer from the Toronto, Ontario office. I've got a master's degree in mechanical engineering, and I deal with uh, the core SolidWorks products, simulation, and all the electrical solutions as well. Uh, outside of work, I do like to travel. That's kind of cliche, but I've kind of backpacked through Central and South America, Asia, and uh, when life is normal, I'd like to go back to go to Egypt. And apart from that, I'm also into squash, table tennis, and uh, learning to rock climb. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn off my video. And, uh, and before we get too much further into it, if you do have any questions during the presentation, there is the Q&A tab uh, next to the chat up there. Uh, both myself and Saran will be keeping an eye on that throughout the presentation. Uh, so if you do have a specific question about the presentation, uh, please use the Q&A tab there. Uh, the general chat, uh, you guys can interact with yourselves, interact with each other uh, within the uh, session, but have at it. And with that, I'll let, uh, let's go ahead and get our presentation going here. Right. So now that you know who we are and uh, you know what we look like, uh, I'd like to start with a brief outline of our presentation. Right. So we are going to be looking at the early days of a SOLIDWORKS electrical user. So we'll share with you some uh, do's and don'ts of uh, uh, setting up your title block library, uh, speeding up the process of adding manufacturer parts, integrating your 2D footprint symbols and 3D models into the library. And finally, there's going to be a big section on setting up uh, project templates and create the wire styles within it. And uh, there's a tiny section at the end that deals with uh, some interface settings that'll make your life easier. Now, to start us off, Charles is going to take us through the first section that is on title blocks. So I'll hand it over to you, Charles. Yeah, thanks, Saran. So one of the things I want to talk about first with title blocks is, is back to those of you that may have taken a drafting class or not, is, is the standard of a title block, right? So this goes back to the days of when we actually did paper drawings, you know, on the old drafting machines on the table, right? Uh, we had the binding edge on the left hand side we had the paper space the actual paper size and the border was offset from that paper size to make sure we were inside of that right and then you had the title block drawing information down in the lower left hand corner uh, because when you folded up these larger sizes to store them you needed the title block information there visible right away without having to unfold everything so there's some uh, standardized sizing there uh, for our inch drawings and for our metric drawings with the border offsets and that type of stuff. So keep that in mind when you're creating your title blocks that this is the standards that kind of been accepted by everyone. Um, things to keep in mind also is that, you know, larger title blocks in the mechanical world have typically been zoned, right? With A's and new alpha numerical characters referring to the columns and rows. Typically electrical uses columns and rows also, uh, but ours are typically numbered. And one of the things to keep in mind is that when you are establishing rows and columns in your drawings, Keep in mind the default wire spacing for our symbols in electrical, which is a quarter inch or five millimeters, right? Uh, some more tips and tricks to use also is if you're going to import your existing DWG format, uh, make sure it's in model space. Uh, that's the one limitation that we have. The other thing is 
before you import it, check to make sure it's the correct size, right? Because DWGs are unitless. They, you know, one inch or one could be one inch or one millimeter, right? So uh, if you have to create multiple sizes, uh, create your smallest one and then create your blocks up above or their tile blocks bigger for that. But you can copy and paste that drawing information from drawing to drawing um, inside of SOLIDWORKS Electrical. Helps speed up that title block. Awesome. Um, you, ability. Uh, the other thing is utilize temporary sketch segments and object snaps to position your text. I use this tremendously when setting up title blocks for customers during implementation service. Is, you know, if I need to center that text in that box, draw a diagonal line across it and use my midpoint snap and then delete that diagonal line. Um, also, if adding rows, decide whether you want them to line up with your wires and symbols. Remember, I mentioned this earlier. Uh, the standard snap spacing for our multi-circuit symbols is five millimeter or a quarter inch. Okay, so keep that in mind. Um, along with that is when you use a title block and start a new schematic drawing or a new line diagram drawing inside of your project, it pulls in the snap and grid settings and the drawing view settings um, from that title block. So make sure you set those in that title block before you save it also. And remember, back to the standardized five millimeter or quarter inch spacing for your snaps will help greatly improve your design speeds, right? Uh, other thing to keep in mind is line types, textiles, and dimension styles are also retained in the title block file. Uh, one other thing I forgot to mention in there too is layers are re retained in the drawing styles. So if you have a bunch of extra layers, a bunch of extra line types, textiles in your DWG that you imported, you might want to purge those out so that way you don't have all that extra stuff being brought into your projects. All right. Uh, that is pretty much what I had for title blocks, tips and tricks. And with that, I'll pass it over to Saran to get us going on the rest of the library stuff. All right. Thank you, Charles. That Those two slides were chock full of information there. So. I'm going to take us through the next section, which will be about uh, the part library. Charles, do you want to mute yourself? Yeah, I'm going to do that. Sorry. Uh, right. So one of the first things you would want to do after installing electrical is uh, set up your manufacturer part library. And eventually, that is what is going to generate your accurate bill of materials, accurate wire styles, et cetera. So one of the first things I like to do is take a look at the electrical content portal and see what you can download from there. You can access the electrical content portal from the manufacturer part manager. Uh, there's about 137 million parts and almost the same number of footprints and uh, about 5,600 cables spread across a thousand uh, uh, manufacturers. And if you do choose to download anything from there, it's going to be a .part.tw zip file. And that's essentially a part archive, and you'll be adding it to your library by unarchiving from the manufacturer part manager. Now, as far as a strategy for what you want to download, you could uh, sort of firebomb and download entire catalogs, or you can download specific part numbers. If it's the latter, uh, look up the part number and you get the option to download a 3D part as well as an archive specific to SOLIDWORKS Electrical 2D schematic. If the goal is to kind of download an entire catalog or subcatalog of a manufacturer, uh, that's also doable. So for example, I'm looking at uh, Schneider Electric buttons and switches as well as Schneider Electric emergency switches. Now keep in mind with this approach, you'll probably end up with a bunch of part numbers that you don't need, and you're gonna have to go ahead and uh, clean them up afterwards. Now the good thing is when you are about to download these uh, archives, uh, you do get a preview of uh, all the part numbers and the quantities uh, that are in the archives. So you get a pretty decent idea of uh, what you're getting. And finally, uh, both of these, uh, these archives tend to come in two versions, uh, a silver version and a gold version. And the gold access is typically available if you're on active subscription. And uh, the differentiator between the two is the presence of panel layout symbols in the gold version. And turns out, and Charles mentioned in 10 minutes ago, that a couple of days ago, they changed uh, it from gold to under subscription but they still do the same thing essentially. Now, a lot of these parts that you will download may not have the circuits and terminals set up the way you would like it to. So there's a good chance you would wanna consider editing some of these to set them up properly. 
Now, as good as the content portal is, it's not going to have everything you want. So an alternate strategy would be to download uh, from or import from an Excel file or even a text file. So essentially what you're doing is uh, mapping the properties of the manufacturer part onto the columns of your Excel. And your user data field could also be part of this mapping. So essentially, the more columns you have in your Excel, the better it is during the import process. There is support for multi-sheet Excel if you have set it up that way. And this will not only add new part numbers, but can also be used to modify the existing ones. And uh, what this does is it creates the part numbers and adds their properties, but you will still need to uh, finish up the circuits and terminals for them. And one last thing, you can save the import configuration to remember the column mapping. So during the import process, you can choose to associate these properties to either a column number or a column title. So if you've got a whole bunch of these Excel files, uh, to import that are laid out the same way, uh, this can save you a fair bit of time down the road. So that sort of concludes my subsection on manufacturer parts, or uh, how to add them. Charles, uh, did you have anything to add there? I uh, think uh, you need to unmute, all right. So with that, I'm going to jump into the next section, which is about manufacturer parts and uh, circuits and terminals. So I kind of mentioned having to potentially set up uh, uh, the circuits and terminals of the part after you create them. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, some tips and tricks that will speed that up. So it is possible to copy the circuits from one part to another. Um, so if you are doing a whole bunch of I.O. modules or large connectors, I'd recommend creating the big one first uh, and then copy uh, its circuits and terminals into the smaller parts and deleting whatever it is that you do not need. Uh, if you're going to be adding uh, a bunch of circuits of different kind, I find the add multiple tool a huge time saver. This allows you to uh, add different types of circuits, uh, control the number of circuits of each type and the number of terminals per circuit. Okay. There's also the use and up, uh, and there's also the up and down arrow that you can use to reorder the circuits. And where this might come into play is uh, uh, when matching your symbol circuits against the part circuits, SOLIDWORKS Electrical will look at the circuit types and the order of the circuit. So if you set them, if you set up the order correctly right now, this could save you a fair bit of time when you're actually doing your design work. And lastly, you do have the option to add a symbol to the part circuit. So if you find yourself using the same symbol for all your relay coils or three pole normally open power contacts, uh, why not just uh, link a default to the part circuit as opposed to having to browse for it down the road. So that takes care of my part circuits. Now these circuits would ideally have terminals as well. And for each terminal, you can set up the name of the terminal. And uh, this is what's going to give you that accurate uh, wire from to list. You can also set up the termination type of the wires into that terminal. So whether it's a bare wire, if it's a fork terminal, ring terminal, uh, something to point out, it's a new feature that was added in 2019 and it doesn't really add anything to your drawings. It's just a data field that you can call out in a report or um, a connection label. You can also set up uh, other rules for each terminal. For example, the maximum number of wires that can go in there the sizes, some limitations on the sizes of the wire. And the reason why you would wanna consider setting them up is so that you can take advantage of some of these uh, default design rule checks that will identify violations of these rules, okay? So now that my parts and circuits and terminals are all set up, let's take a uh, look at uh, the classification manager. Now, this is something that doesn't uh, get talked about a lot, but I think it's a pretty handy tool. Uh, so you know that SOLIDWORKS uh, Electrical comes with a bunch of default classes in which you put your symbols and parts and so on. Now until 2018, you were stuck with the default classes, right? And that might not have been ideal for situations where you had a part, uh, which is not adequately uh, described by any of the default classes. Well, starting 2018, you can now create custom classes and custom subclasses. 
Now, keep in mind, uh, if there's a default class that you do not use, uh, you unfortunately cannot get rid of it. And any class that you create at a component level will be seen in the manufacturer library, symbol library, and the 2D footprint library. And just to take it a little further, uh, you can also create custom classes for title blocks, macros, and cables. Uh, and obviously, all of this allows you to uh, arrange your uh, parts and title blocks and macros properly. But I'd say this doesn't end there. Uh, you can take it a little bit further with uh, classes, especially for components. Now, for each class, uh, these uh, you can essentially set up uh, properties that propagate to all the items in that class, including part numbers. So in the properties of the class, you can identify a, a default root. So if you've noticed that uh, all circuit breakers as a default have Q as a root, or are all motors start with M as a root, well, that's where it's getting this information from. You can also link a specific user data configuration file to each class, right? So at this point, I think you guys know that there's about 20 available user data fields that are typically renamed to reflect custom properties. And this renaming information is what's retained in this uh, user data configuration file. So by linking a class to a unique uh, configuration file, uh, you're essentially setting up so that each class can now have its own set of custom properties. Apart from that, uh, you can identify a default 2D footprint symbol and a default 3D part for that class. So if your part number is not linked to something specific, it's going to default to what's identified for the class. And uh, finally, you can set up up to seven manufacturer data fields, right? So these manufacturer data fields are unique to manufacturer parts only. And these are on top of the user data fields that uh, are available for all objects. Uh, usually these data fields are mapped to different properties and uh, you can vary the mapping across your classes. So for example, in the buttons and switch class here, I have data number one mapped to current rating. That's great, but it may not make sense for uh, a cabinet class or you know a DIN rail uh, class of components, right? So you can vary the mapping from one class to another. And if you do choose to use these in your schematic symbols, you can call them out by using the D TD1, TD2 attributes and so on, okay? So that sort of uh, concludes my section on the light manufacturer part library and as well as tips and tricks on their circuits and terminals. I'm just gonna check with Charles quickly to see if he has anything to add here. Now, Saran, that's some great, wonderful information there. Uh, the classifications, being able to customize those, this has been a long standing thing that people had wanted and it was great to see that added a couple of years ago. Um, if you're not utilizing that, definitely utilize it helps eliminate people from just throwing devices in the miscellaneous catalog or category because there wasn't any classification for those devices. So it works out great and wonderful. Awesome. So jumping into the next section, now that you have your part library set up, chances are you would want to represent these parts in a 2D cabinet or a 3D assembly. So I'll walk us through uh, both of these libraries and how to set them up, starting with the 2D panel layout symbol. So typically they would look like having the geometry, possibly some attributes and an insertion point that allows you to locate them appropriately on a DIN rail or whatever it is. Now, usually you're going to download a DWG or a DXF uh, uh, file of these panel layout symbols, either from the content portal or from the manufacturer website uh, directly, or you could even have your own library of these symbols from a previous uh, electrical software. Whatever the case is, uh, you can import those files or a folder full of files into the 2D footprint library. During the import process, you can change the properties of these symbols. So set up the unit system, give them a description, put them in appropriate class. Now, if these symbols are coming from uh, a different electrical software and they had attributes in them already, it is possible to map the attributes to their SolidWorks electrical counterpart during this process. And if you're doing a whole lot of attribute mapping, you might want to save the import configuration as well. The only other thing that I'd like to point out is you wanna make sure that when uh, setting the unit system of these uh, symbols, you want to maintain the same units as the one that the symbol was created in. So now that these symbols are imported into your library, let's take a look at what they're likely to look like. 
Okay. Unfortunately, manufacturers will make a whole bunch of information available, including other views, title blocks, annotations that you may not want. So the first step is to remove any unwanted geometry. Uh, now, a lot of the times I've noticed that these unwanted geometries tend to be on different layers. So you can actually hide or show these layers and isolate whatever you don't want and get rid of them. Uh, once you're done with that, you can go ahead and add the attributes and the insertion points that you want. And there you go. You've got your perfect panel layout symbol. Now that you have your 2D panel layout symbol and your part number set up properly, but independently, it's time to link them to each other. And you can do that in the manufacturer part properties, right? So just browse to the appropriate 2D footprint symbols and link it. Now, one of the things I notice uh, a few users do is uh, specify the dimensions of the part in your part properties. And if you're going to do this, just be, be, be aware of what it, uh, how that affects your 2D footprint symbol. It, it's going to scale your footprint symbol to match those dimensions. And uh, where you might want to, where you, I mean, where this might be an issue is uh, it actually takes the uh, bounding box of your 2D footprint symbol and scales it up to match the dimensions. And if you do have any attribute that is outside the symbol, unfortunately, it'll be included in the scaling as well. So after scaling, the actual size of the symbol may not accurately reflect the dimensions that they are. So if you really need to, uh, so we recommend avoiding these dimensions unless you really need to call them out in some kind of report, or if you're okay with uh, showing them inside the symbol as opposed to outside the geometry of the symbol. Uh, the other half of this equation might be the 3D users. So if you do have the electrical 3D add-in, uh, you might want to set up your uh, 3D models to be able to uh, show them in a, a assembly of your panel. So typically you would download these 3D models from again, the content portal or directly from a part site uh, or manufacturer site. These are usually step files or IGES files or some kind of CAD neutral format. Your mechanical team might even have a library of these. Uh, whatever the case is, there is an electrical component wizard available that'll walk you through the process of turning or adding the electrical intelligence to these uh, parts. Uh, the first one being adding mate references. So if you mate a part uh, the same way every time, a good idea might be to set up the mate references where you define the type of the mate and the face on which those mates are going to be applied. So when you drag and hover this part into an assembly, and if you're hovering over an appropriate geometry, those mate references will kick in and your part will just snap into place. Saves you a lot of uh, mating time down the road. So very ideal for uh, components that are uh, set on DIN rails, on the door, on the back of a panel, and the wizard will kind of walk you through the process of creating a mate reference specific to those kinds of situations. There's also the option to add connection points. And these connection points uh, represent the terminals of your part, right? So this is where the wires are going to route to. And uh, this is also what's going to give you those accurate uh, wire lengths down the road. Now you do have the option to associate these connection points to the terminals of the manufacturer part from your electrical library. So when your electrical def designer defines the wiring information, wiring information of a part in schematics, the 3D side of the software knows exactly where those terminals are located in the 3D model and therefore where to route the wires to. There's also another type of connection point called the cable connection point, right? And this, uh, this controls the termination of a cable jacket if that's what is being routed. So you've got a connection point for your wires and another one for the cable jacket. And, uh, and a 3D model could be set up with both of these if you want, right? So in which case the result would look like something like this, right? So you've got your cable jacket and the four individual conductors. Now that, you have, now that you have set up your 3D models, you do have the option of uh, storing them wherever you want, including uh, PDM. And uh, SolidWorks Electrical can interface with PDM if you only have PDM Professional. Uh, if you are using 3D parts, you might want to take a closer look at the option of uh, creating uh, a copy of these 3D parts into the project folder. So something you may not avoid or want, depending on the situation. 
And finally, uh, just like the 2D footprint symbols, you might want to link the part now to the 3D model that you've set up. And again, done in the manufacturer part properties. If you don't do this, you're gonna have to browse for this 3D model or uh, it'll try to use the default 3D part for that class. So I'd say before I jump into my next section, I'm just gonna check with Charles to see if he wants to add anything about manufacturer parts and circuits and terminals, or sorry, yeah. actually footprints and 3D. Models. Yeah, for all of that, yeah. Uh, so great some stuff, information there too. Um, one thing I do wanna point out though is, is that sometimes you may need to add a cable connection point to a part that doesn't have any electrical wires being round, routed to it, right? Um, such as cable glands or cord grips, right? So the cable or cord, or cord would go through that component and then splay out from there, right? So uh, you can add those cable connection points to other components that are not necessarily electrical or components that the wires actually connect to or the cable cords actually connect to. So uh, keep that in mind also. And then one other thing too I wanted to point out is uh, whether you use smart features or not, if anyone out there is using smart features within their parts, um, you know, like your buttons and switches, you can add the holes that are required for those on the door as smart features. Um, this is where that, you know, copy to pro uh, parts to project would come into play. Because uh, if you remember, smart features are added to the component level, not the assembly level, right? So, uh, you know, you want to make sure that you keep track of that. You know, if your cabinets are going to be used multiple times, you may have to create unique identifiers for those cabinets, you know, unique part numbers and unique assemblies or parts for those cabinets to apply those smart features to. So just keep that in mind. Right. Yeah, those are a couple of very good points. Um, right, moving on, uh, I'd like, I do have a few tips and tricks uh, for the symbol library now. Uh, out of the box, SolidWorks Electrical does come with a whole bunch of symbols spread across different classes. But if you do have custom symbols created, you can import existing DWG files. And if these DWG files happen to be blocks and they have attributes in them already, you do get the opportunity to map those attributes to SolidWorks Electrical uh, counterparts. And just like Charles mentioned with title blocks, make sure that these symbols are created in uh, uh, model space, not paper space in their DWG files. And uh, the next one's kind of a big one, actually. It's uh, pretty underrated, but uh, something I tell almost all our users is to never modify the default symbols and title blocks, right? So all the symbols that you get with uh, SolidWorks Electrical, I'm going to call them default symbols. And if you do need to customize them, uh, do not modify those symbols. Instead, create a copy rename that copy and make your modifications. And the reason being, these symbols are technically DWG files uh, stored into your application data folder. So when you modify a certain symbol, you're essentially modifying that uh, file name uh, in the app data folder. Where this could be an issue is, uh, let's say you're performing a version upgrade or a service, or a service pack upgrade. Uh, SolidWorks Electrical will try to refresh your library with the default symbols. So what could happen is uh, all the default symbols you've been customizing might then be replaced by their original versions if you're not careful. This could also happen if you're running the data update tool when unarchiving a project. So imagine uh, you're unarchiving a five-year-old project or a project that somebody else had sent you. If you're not careful, you could potentially replace the custom symbols that you've created uh, with uh, their default versions from an older project or a project from a different user. And by the way, when running this data update, I tell users to uh, pay very close attention to anything that is being replaced. There's a preview uh, window that allows you to compare the new object and the existing one in your library. And if you're not sure of what you want to do, you do have the option to keep both of these so that you can uh, take a closer look at them later on. However, if you, uh, instead of modifying the default symbols, if you've been uh, creating copies with different names and modifying them, uh, those will be safe from all the above mentioned situations, right? So definitely a good uh, tip to carry forward. So with that, uh, I'm gonna jump into our next section, uh, which is about project templates, right? So we are done with libraries. Uh, let's take a look at what we can do at a template level. 
Now, these templates, if you wanted to define them, they're essentially projects saved at a specific stage. And hopefully that sentence becomes clearer by the end of the uh, section. So think of templates as starting point for your new projects. Now, the software does come with the default ANSI and an IEC template, and I would recommend using them to build your custom template. So essentially create a new project with the ANSI template, make your changes, and then save it back as a template. And that is what we're going to look at in this section. Things that you can uh, customize in your template are project settings, wire styles, uh, the default title blocks linked to each drawing type, any kind of formula you would like to build for numbering your components, rows, drawings, et cetera. Um, if you want to use the user data for project properties and how you want to map them, any reports and design rule checks you might want to add to your new projects. And finally, some default configurations for PLC drawings, terminal strip drawings, et cetera. Now, a bulk of the work is going to happen in project configuration. And this has uh, you know, quite a, uh, about six or seven tabs. And we're going to summarize uh, each of these tabs, starting with the general tab. In the general tab, you're going to be setting up the project units, uh, format for dates and revisions, among other things. In the title block tab, you'll be setting up the default title block for uh, the different types of drawings. So if you mostly use B-size paper, so it makes sense that when you create new schematics, it should start with a B-size title block. Now it is possible to change the title blocks on a one-off basis, but good to set up these defaults. Uh, just keep in mind, uh, if you plan on duplicating an Imperial project into a metric project or vice versa, uh, you would want to take a closer look at the dimensions and the font height and project configuration, right? So in your metric project, a one millimeter font translates into one inch font in uh, Imperial project. So you might want to go ahead and make those changes. Likewise, make sure to uh, link uh, to or relink to an appropriate title block. Okay. Uh, moving on to a different tab uh, of the project configuration, uh, the symbol tab. Again, that's a pretty underrated tab and you can use this to customize wire and cable label symbols. And uh, if you don't know what those are, uh, setting those up kind of gives you a bit of flexibility in uh, how you display information on a wire. So you can either display the wire tag or the wire label. Now the wire tag is just a single entity uh, based off of a formula. And that formula could have many, many uh, variables driving it. So if it's a really large uh, formula or if it has a lot of attributes and you end up with a massive tag on a short piece of wire, that may not look the greatest, right? So you can instead, you can opt for a wire labeled style of display. And the wire labels are essentially symbols where all the attributes are kind of laid out around the wire. So depending on the situation, what might be, one might give you a cleaner look uh, than the other. Another tab that was recently added is the attribute tab, right? And what this does is it controls symbol and title block attributes across the project. So you know that all symbols come with component tags, manufacturer information, uh, but these attributes are not very standardized. Uh, the attribute tab allows you to standardize the font uh, and the height of those attributes across the project. You can also control their visibility across their project, right? So for example, if you're generating a customer facing pa uh, drawing package, you can choose to uh, make all the manu part numbers invisible uh, before you print it and then show them again uh, for internal purposes. And whatever the settings that you opt for, uh, these are going to override uh, the font settings uh, of these attributes in the symbol or the title box themselves. And just to wrap up project configuration, uh, this one's another big one, the mark tab. And you would typically come in here to set up uh, formulas for drawing numbering, row numbering, component tags, terminal strip tags, et cetera. And this will set up the numbering across the entire project. Now, we are going to look at uh, setting up these formulas in a future slide, but for now, I think uh, I'm sort of done with the project configuration. And uh, before I jump into wire styles, I'd like to check with Charles to see if he would like to add anything. Yeah, one of the things I wanted to point out when you know, you've know you got that attribute slide there and that attributes are a great way of uh, you know controlling or changing the fonts of symbols, right? So I had, a, in particular, we had a customer that said, hey, we wanna change the font on all of the symbols because we don't like Tahoma. We want Microsoft Sansurf, whatever it was, right? Um, instead of going in and modifying every single default symbol in the library, 
all we had to do is come in here to their project configuration, set up a drawing style within the project, and then reassign the text style of that attribute from the standard to that new text style, and it updated across the whole project and any symbol they insert in the future adjusts to that. Uh, likewise, one other thing I want to point out too is on the text tab of the project configuration there um, is the XY location of the default text that is inserted for items such as your wire labels, uh, not the labels, but the, the marks, right? Uh, cable marks, all that type of stuff is there's the XY coordinate location there. Um, and that controls where those are placed. Same thing for black box symbol, connection points, that type of stuff. So uh, keep an eye on that. <clears throat> Great way to update all across the project. So if you want to move your wire numbers <clears throat> along the wires for it, you don't have to do it manually. You can do it through the XY coordinate position within that text tab there. Uh, great information, though, other than those things there, Saran. So what do you got for us next? Right. Uh, those are actually two very good points. I should have actually covered those myself. But uh, yeah, let's move into uh, uh, setting up our wire styles now, right? So keep in mind, your wire styles are specific to project. So ideally store them in a template. There's no wire style library. Uh, so create them in your project and store it in your template. So what that means is when you use this template to create a new project, all the wire styles from the template are also in your new projects, right? So from the wire style manager, you can uh, create groups as well as new wire styles. These new wire styles could be single line styles or a multi-line wire style. So think uh, uh, control wire versus uh, three phase power. Uh, you can also create groups in which to put these wire styles. Uh, and in the default ANSI and IEC template, these groups are voltage based. But in the past, I've also created templates where these groups are based off of uh, gauge and color. So if you have, let's say, uh, 10 gauges with eight colors across them, so that's about 80 wire styles, uh, put them in appropriate groups so you can easily find them later. Now, creating 80 wire styles is not fun, which is where the copy paste tools might be handy. You can uh, use this to um, copy individual styles or an entire group full of many styles in the same project or across different projects. And finally, you can create hydraulic and pneumatic styles as well. And keep in mind, the symbol library already comes with some hydraulic, pneumatic, and PNID symbols. So I would say this software is pretty good for creating those simple uh, schematics of hydraulic or pneumatic nature. And just to wrap this up, uh, you can also choose the scheme of wire numbering that you want, right? You can either choose to number individual num uh, wires or have a number for every voltage potential that you have. Now, I did mention groups and how you can create, uh, put the wire styles into those groups. So apart from this being an organization tool, you can also push a range of options across to all the wire styles in that group. Uh, for example, the starting number of the wire, right? Whether you want to start the numbering at one or 100, uh, would you like unique wire numbers across the project or the book or the folder? Uh, do you even want wire numbers or not? And finally, if you would like to have different or shared incremental counters across the wire styles in that group. Now, speaking of wire styles, uh, let's take a look at the properties of those. Uh, you can set the name description and the type of wire style that is. You can also create a, a customized uh, wire numbering formula as well as an equipotential formula. And depending on the choices you made a couple of slides ago, the appropriate formula would kick in. There's also the color of the line you're drawing, the color of the actual wire, and you can set up to three colors. For, for example, if you do have blue white wire, you can set up the gauge, uh, link it to a part number. And finally, if you're planning on routing this in 3D, you should probably set the diameter and some bend radius rules. Now imagine if you have these 8200 wire styles, uh, setting up the properties for each of them could be fairly cumbersome, right? So that's where the Excel import export capability might be a huge time saver, right? So essentially export the properties of your wire styles to Excel, do your data entry there and import it back from there. And this functionality is not just limited to wire style properties. You'll notice in the uh, Excel uh, import export template, you can, there's templates for properties of all objects, properties for all electrical components in your project, all the wires in your project, PLCs, and so on. 
just keep in mind, if you're uh, doing this to populate uh, the properties of wire styles, you cannot create new styles in the Excel file. You can only modify the existing ones, okay? And the one last piece of information uh, we're talking about for these wire styles is the formula of them, right? So there is a wire style editor where you use a combination of variables and functions to build uh, custom formulas. And uh, the variables that you would see for a wire style formula builder would be very different from the variables that you would see for, let's say, a row numbering formula builder. And this makes sense. There's also a list of functions with a description and uh, an example. So you use a combination of both to get the result that you want. If you do intend on putting any kind of static text inside the formula, so think a dash or space, all of that goes inside double quotes. And uh, there's also a formula tester that you can verify that the formula gives you what you want. And finally, uh, go ahead and save those formulas in the project in case you want to reuse or play around with them later on. Now, let's take a look at some sample formulas here. Uh, I've got uh, one where the wire numbering is based on uh, the drawing and the row where the wire is drawn along with the color and gauge information. So I'm calling out each of those four attributes. Not to mention, I'm also performing some, I'm also applying some functions to the file tag and the row tag so I can do some math on them. And that gives me my wire style that I want, or the wire tag that I want. Another option would be to create uh, wire tags based on the origin and the destination of the wire. So I'm calling out the component tag on the origin uh, as well as the terminal and the same information on the destination side, right? I'm also throwing in some static text here so that I can separate all these attributes. Uh, switching tracks a little bit. Uh, this is a formula for the component label where it's based on uh, uh, where the symbol is placed, uh, what drawing and what row it is placed on. And just to take it a step further, if there's only one component in that row, I don't want to see a sequence number and the second component gets a, becomes K1, the third num uh, component becomes K2. And to sort of uh, create that kind of wire labeling, again, calling out the file tag, row tag, component root, which is the alphabetical identifier. Now for the sequence number, I am throwing in an if statement where if the sequence number is one, leave it blank or else sequence number minus one. Right, so you're not just limited to all the variables and functions that you see in the list. You can also throw in uh, if statements to be pretty creative with how the formula behaves. And one more example is uh, numbering your drawings based on four characters starting at 100 with the uh, leading zeros. Okay. So with that being done, uh, I before I jump into, uh, I guess, the final section of what I am doing, I'm going to check with Charles to see if he had anything for wire styles. We did have one question come up in our question and answers here is uh, in regards to twisted pairs uh, for wire styles. Um, in electrical, unfortunately, you can't define uh, wires or pairs of wires as twisted. Uh, probably the closest thing you could do is say that they're part of a multi-wire, you know, multi-phase wire system. Um, and then on your actual schematic drawing, uh, you would drop in a passive symbol that represents the twisting. And then you can call out whether it's, you know, what the type of twisting is required if it is truly individual wires that you manually twist. Um, or the other side of it would be is to associate those to a cable that is twisted within it. You know, in this particular co uh, question, the customer asked or uh, attendee asked whether it be, you know, J1939 wire. Um, you know, in that case, it's probably a predefined cable. So you'd have a cable association, associate those wires to the cable cores. I would still probably drop in the schematic symbol or the passive symbol in the schematic to represent that those are twisted. Um, but from an electric or a SOLIDWORKS electrical perspective, uh, the wire is just connected from point A to point B. What happens in the middle of it, it really doesn't matter. Uh, the only other drawback to this is if you wanted to show that, unfortunately, we can't show twisted pairs in the 3D environment. So if you do want to route those in 3D, we're not going to twist them in 3D. Um, we just don't have the capabilities currently with the API within the routing tools to do that in the 3D environment. So uh, hopefully that answered your, your question there, Scott. Um, and uh, if you do need a little more information on that, definitely reach out to Saran or myself, and we can give you more information on 
uh, twisted pairs inside of a actual schematic drawing. Okay. Uh, but other than that, that's some great information there, Saran, on the formulas, on the wire styles. Uh, I always use the export import uh, to Excel for wire style creations for customers because it helps speed that up tremendously. Right. And good call on the passive symbols, actually. Uh, if you take a look at your uh, symbol library, there's actually a class called passive symbols. And you will see in there are some very commonly used symbols like wire bumps, uh, a symbol for shielded cables. So definitely, uh, it's, it's a pretty underutilized uh, class of symbols, I would say. All right, so moving, just to wrap this up, uh, I've got a quick section on reports and design rule checks. And uh, if you would like to have all your new projects have specific design rule checks and uh, reports, go ahead and add them in. I mean, things like uh, things that uh, like a bill of materials, wire from to list, a drawing list, list of cables, I mean, things that all projects should have, why not just uh, add it to the template? Uh, you also have the option of uh, customizing these reports at a project level. So uh, they remain unaffected at the application level if they're being used in other projects and so on. Uh, something to keep in mind, though, is uh, these reports are linked to the unit system, uh, right? So if you are in a metric project, you, get, you have access to metric reports. And if you're in an imperial project, you access imperial reports. And pretty much all the default uh, reports uh, in SolidWorks Electrical come in both flavors. If you're sort of curious about where these uh, report configurations are stored, uh, they are stored as XML files in the application data folder. And depending on whether they are project level customizations or not, uh, they're stored in different locations that you can read about here. And finally, if you do need to change the unit system of a report, all you need to do is modify the XML file and change the measurement value for, uh, to one for metric and zero for imperial. Almost done here. Uh, let's take a look at uh, what else we can do to our projects, uh, namely uh, customizing the user data fields of the project properties, right? So if all your new projects needs to have some custom properties, might as well go ahead and do it at this point. Uh, go ahead and create any empty drawings, cover pages, drawing list reports, or even some kind of book and folder structures that you would like to see in all your new projects. If you need to draw wires, so for example, if all your new projects need to have main power coming in, might as well draw that in. And finally, create locations and sublocations uh, that you want to see in your new projects, right? So. Now that you've got your uh, pro empty project uh, looking exactly the way you want it to, go ahead and save it as a template in the project manager, right? So this template will now be used to create your new projects. Now, templates are always evolving. And as a new user, chances are you're going to think of new things to add to your template every other day. So if you do need to modify your custom templates, all you need to do is, uh, again, start a new project using your custom template make your changes and save that project as the template again. Just keep in mind uh, to use the same name, uh, same template name. So you're overriding the existing templates as opposed to creating some kind of duplicate. And uh, now that uh, all your libraries and templates are set up, it's time to archive the environment, right? So you're essentially backing up your libraries and templates. And uh, you know, once you actually start creating real projects, I'd recommend creating these environment archives regularly so that you're backing them up. You should also consider creating a full environment archive when you're doing a server upgrade or a move, or if you're reinstalling electrical, or even if you're upgrading electrical to a new service pack or a version. It is also the only supported method of creating backups. And over time, as your database grows larger and larger, the size of these archives may become too big. So you do have the option of customizing what is included in these archives, right? So you can do one environment archive with uh, libraries only, another one with uh, projects only. So you can kind of piecemeal it if you like. And uh, supposedly in the 2021 version, there's going to be an auto archiver, archiver tool also included. Prior to that, uh, you can set yourself some uh, reminders uh, to uh, uh, do an archive every X number of days. So that concludes what I had for the presentation. And uh, Charles is going to walk us through the uh, uh, remainder of it. And if you wanted to add anything to the previous sections, feel free to Charles.
Yeah, I just want to touch one point on the archiving of the environment. Um, we always recommend to all to our customers is once you're done with the project, archive out that individual project and remove it from your environment. Um, that's going to help reduce the size of these archive in, of the environments. And it's also going to help speed up archiving the environment, right? Um, we have seen cases where customers had hundreds of projects in their environment still active. Um, which caused the archive environment to actually crash because it runs out of space, um, runs out of hard drive space, runs out of RAM, and all that type of stuff comes into play. So um, making sure that you archive individual projects and save those out to a network location or stored location when you're done actually working on them helps keep that environment size smaller and reduced. And so that way you don't have any issues with actual environment archives and that type of stuff. And you know, once you have a project archive, you can open it up anywhere else, right? You can open it up as built. You don't have to worry about not having everything that was in that project there. So um, definitely keep that in mind with those environment archives. So, yeah. all right, so let's take a look at the interface settings, right? So uh, one of the things that we wanna keep an eye on is the, the tools, right? So you go to tools, interface configuration, uh, some things to keep in mind that a lot of people want to change is the zoom direction, right? So if you're using your mouse wheel, um, you can reverse it or keep it the way it is. Um, you can have it set up the same as SolidWorks, or you can have it set up the same as some of the other electrical programs out there. So whatever your comfort zone is. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is the pick box and the crosshair size, right? So if you're used to a draft site or AutoCAD environment, you can create that crosshair to be a percentage of that screen. Um, you know, you can go 100%, 50%, 10%, whatever you want. And then the pick box size, right? And remember the pick box size is pickle uh, is pixels, uh, not pickles, but pixels. And that really plays into factor when you're using object snaps, um, right? So you're trying to get the end point or the midpoint, how big that pick box size is going to affect that uh, snapping ability. And then also background color, right? The default is this kind of offset grayish white color um, almost looks like a piece of paper is what it's supposed to be but a lot of people prefer the back uh, the black background so you definitely can change that there um, some other things uh, before we get into the user rights though is on the interface configuration is uh, there's some in the more recent releases there's some options for graphics accelerator you can do OpenGL, you can do um, some of the other different graphics accelerators there so if you are having some graphic issues uh, you might want to take a look at those and also reach out to our support team um, other thing too is user rights management, right? So you can set up the user rights management. If you wanna control who has access to what inside of the projects or uh, library access, that type of stuff, you can set up user rights management. And in 2020, they finally gave us control to create custom roles. Um, prior to 2020, we were limited to this predefined categories. Um, and unfortunately you can only be in one category as a user. So you had to do a lot of in and out of different different user roles to get to the full access. Um, last thing is keyboard shortcuts. If you're a person that likes to use keyboard shortcuts, you can set that up. Um, it's simply by right clicking on the very top menu and say more commands, and then you can set up your keyboard shortcuts for any of your commands within the application, All right? So it's uh, definitely can set that stuff up. Now here's some of the additional options or offerings from SOLIDWORKS or from not SOLIDWORKS, but from Hawkridge Systems. Uh, we do provide training, uh, full training coverage for our electrical schematic class, which we do over five days, um, our electrical 3D add-in class over two days, and the electrical advanced class over three days also. Uh, we do also offer services such as implementation, which is there for helping out with library and template creation, uh, implementation for over-the-shoulder mentoring of how do I apply these commands to my specific projects or my specific design needs, uh, custom report creation, and also installation and server moves and upgrades. And then of course, our award-winning support team is there to handle any of your questions, any issues that you run into. And then some other resources that are great for us is our blog, vlog on Hawkridge website, or our YouTube channel, some great content up there on some quick tips and tricks on electrical for that also. And then some of the other electrical portfolio offerings we have from Hawkridge is we also have SOLIDWORKS PCB. If you're not familiar with that, SOLIDWORKS did partner with Altium uh, to create a PCB design tool. Uh, it does integrate directly with SOLIDWORKS Electrical 3D and allows you to 
port and pass the 3D assembly back and forth between the layout tool inside of SOLIDWORKS PCB and your SOLIDWORKS assemblies. Um, there is a PCB connector available for collaboration with, uh, with Altium and SOLIDWORKS. Uh, it works the same way as the SOLIDWORKS PCB where you can pass that 3D assembly back and forth. Uh, we do also offer implementation and training services for SOLIDWORKS PCB. And then one of the other things we offer, which is specific to the, our customers that need harnessing, uh, which is our tool we call Enterprise Harness, uh, which is a gold partner from SOLIDWORKS. Uh, it is perfect for the more complex, complicated harnesses. Uh, think of like the automotive style harnesses, right? We've got this big harness that needs attached to everything. Um, great for large assemblies, handles design changes within SOLIDWORKS seamlessly. Uh, you can create those manufacturer drawings, the flattened states for manufacturing. Uh, we do offer, also offer implementation services for Enterprise Harness. Now the implementation service with Enterprise Harness also includes the user over the shoulder training for that type of stuff. And that is all we really had. And we're up to our time limit almost. We're at five minutes over technically. Uh, but if you do have any other questions, uh, we'll be sitting around uh, and taking those for you guys. But uh, if you don't have any other questions, thank you for attending our session and have a wonderful rest of the conference today. Hope you enjoyed the last two days of content we've had for you and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much.